Welcome back, movie lovers. In today's mind-bending cinematic journey, we follow a time-traveling agent on a mission to thwart a devastating terrorist plot. But as our agent delves deeper into the investigation, they unearth a shocking truth about their own identity and the very fabric of reality itself. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe for more intriguing movie explorations like this one. The movie kicks off with a slick agent in shades, strutting down a dimly lit corridor, sporting a sharp coat and hat. He's got two snazzy briefcases in tow. He strolls over to a staircase leading underground. There, he stumbles upon a sneaky time bomb. Quick as a whip, he cracks open one of his briefcases, and it turns out it's a nifty gadget. Our agent coolly disarms the bomb but gets an unwelcome surprise. An unexpected guest shows up. He pulls out his piece and scans for the intruder. Out of nowhere, this enemy dude catches him off guard and takes a shot. Our agent fires back, but the bomb's ticking down. In a rush, he shoves the bomb into his gadget. Just as he's about to stash it, boom! The bomb goes off, giving our guy a serious facial makeover. He's screaming and reaches for his other briefcase. The intruder, instead of being a jerk, helps him grab it. They lock eyes for a sec, and then the stranger casually splits. Our crispy agent frantically does something with his second case and hops inside it. After the smoke clears, our hero's all wrapped up in bandages, chilling in a hospital bed. His bosses roll in, give him props for trying, and say he should forget about this mission gone wrong. Just focus on healing up for your final gig. Turns out, he was after a real slippery crook known as the Fizzle Bomber. This dude's been doing little attacks, but he's got a grand plan. A mega-sized explosion in New York in 75, taking out loads of folks. Even with the move-on talk, our agent's not giving up on nailing the Fizzle Bomber one last time. After some rest, the doc finally peels off those bandages and drops the news that his face and voice are going to sound way different from here on out thanks to those nasty injuries. The agent checks himself out in the mirror, noticing his messed up but changed face. He nods, accepting the transformation. Fast forward seven years, and his mug's all patched up. He grabs a voice recorder and starts spilling the beans about his life. He's psyched about his next and final gig, and he lays out why it's a big deal. His higher-ups hand him his gear and lay down the rules. Stray off course and you get the juice, the lethal kind. The agent's cool with it, and they toss him that earlier case. Once everything's squared away, he hits the road for his last hurrah. Late night, he's undercover at a city dive, playing bartender, acting like he's waiting for something. In walks this mysterious character, rocking a coat and hat, thirsty as hell. Our bartender slides a drink over and tries to chat it up. They shoot the breeze about some fizzle bomber thing, but then it veers off track. This guy turns out to be a writer, claims he writes confessions and stuff. Bartender dude, who doesn't fit the writer's usual readership, pulls out one of his mags and surprises the scribe. They jaw about it, and the writer says his stuff ain't worth a read. Bartender spills that he dips into those mags for a sneak peek into the female perspective, curious how the other half thinks. Writer guy drops a bombshell. He used to be a gal. Bartender's jaws on the floor. But before he can dig deeper, the writer starts unloading his life saga. It all kicked off on September 13, 1945. He was a newborn, dumped at an orphanage's doorstep. They took him in, slapped the name Jane on him. Little Jane was starry-eyed about space and wondered what having folks would be like. Why they ditched her or what she did wrong, she couldn't fathom. But growing up, something felt different about her. Jane stood out in the orphanage, self-aware and hella curious, way more than the other girls. She made a promise to herself that her future kids would have a real family, something she never had. So she shifted her focus to learning how to throw down. And let me tell you, she could kick butt better than anyone, including the dudes. Plus, she was the brainiac of the class, acing math and science without breaking a sweat. But the other kids thought she was a bit offbeat, you know, weird. As she grew, Jane kind of started hating on herself, realizing that being different was a one-way ticket to not getting adopted. She accepted that no one would take her in as their daughter or even as their old lady. Fast forward a bit. Jane's about to graduate when she crosses paths with Mr. Robertson. This cat was scouting for young women like Jane for some gig with Space Corp, probably dealing with space stuff. He laid it out. They needed ladies who rocked at math, science, and were in shape. Jane was down and threw her hat in the ring. At the interview, Jane laid it all out for the panel. When they asked her what she saw her role as, she straight up told him she was dead serious about what Space Corp wanted. They bought it, and she got in. Space Corp had these special training sessions to see if folks could handle space travel. They hit Jane and the other recruits with some crazy space simulations. Jane felt alive, stoked to the max, but some folks couldn't handle the ride. Then came the endurance and written tests, and Jane breezed through while others sweated bullets. They also did these interviews with a heart rate thingy to check if you're lying. Shortly after, Jane found herself in a brawl with a fellow volunteer. 
she skillfully defended herself, landing a flurry of punches to the girl's face, ultimately putting her on the ground. The staff quickly intervened, taking them both to the clinic. Outside, a doc handed Robertson a report about something funky in Jane's body. The doc hinted that it could disqualify her, but Robertson insisted on keeping it a secret from Jane and said he'd handle it. Jane got the boot from the program without knowing why. While packing her things, Robertson approached her. Jane explained she was just defending herself. He promised to fight for her reinstatement, but Jane couldn't count on him. To make ends meet, she worked as a house helper during the day for a modest family. In her downtime, Jane found solace in reading confession story mags. At night, she struggled with etiquette classes. One rainy night, Jane bumped into a man and asked if he was lost. He replied, I'm waiting for someone. Jane quipped, good things happen to those who wait. The man continued, but only the things left behind by those who hustle. Jane was impressed they shared the same mindset. She described the man to the bartender, emphasizing his looks and wealth, thinking he could change her life. Jane was totally into how that guy treated her, and the bartender, with a smirk on his face, acts like he's seen it all before. Jane leans over and asks the bartender if he's ever been a fool for love. He nods, admitting he's been there once, saying he gets where she's coming from. She spills the beans, saying that being with this dude was the best time of her life, but it all went downhill from there. He told her to wait at the bench, promising to be back, but he ghosted her. Jane figures it was just a fling, so she moves on quick, keeping her hopes alive for Space Corp. Then, out of the blue, Robertson shows up. He lays it all out, revealing the organization he works for ain't about space travel. It's some super-secret government thing that cleans up messes, and they used Space Corps to find special folks like Jane, folks with talents, no family baggage, and no ties to the future. People just like her. Jane's confused, but figures this gig will change her life for the better. Until she finds out she's preggers, and Robertson goes MIA. Turns out that mysterious dude left her with more than just a broken heart. She thought her future was toast. One night, she's writhing in pain on an operating table, surrounded by med staff, ready to pop out the baby. The next morning, a doc comes in, all smiles, saying the C-section went smooth, and she's got herself a healthy baby girl. But then, the doc drops a bombshell, asking Jane if any other docs ever spilled the beans about her body's condition. Jane was all kinds of mixed up, telling the doc she ain't heard squat from them and that everything's A-OK. -okay. Doc lays it out plain. Jane's got both lady and gent bits inside, and even though the female gear was kind of half-baked, it could still cook up a baby. But here's the kicker. They had to yank out her lady parts because of some serious bleeding during childbirth. No worries, though. They pieced her back together and she's got herself some manly gear, but it means more trips to the OR. Jane's mind was blown, tears flowing, couldn't wrap her head around it. Doc's doing the cheerleader routine, saying she'll be just fine. Jane still got her hands full with the baby, telling her she's the best thing ever. Nurse wants to know the baby's name and Jane's thinking of naming her Mini-Me. Jane's now laser-focused on raising the kid right. But guess what? baby gets snatched from the hospital by some old dude. Jane's trying everything, but no luck finding the baby or the perp. Then there's the other mess. Jane's got to go under the knife three times and chill in the hospital for nearly a year to turn into a dude. It's like she's losing herself in the process. Eleven months roll by, Jane stares in the mirror and finally sees the new dude looking back, realizing the old her is history. Jane's pouring her heart out to the bartender, saying that mirror is a constant reminder of the one who wrecked her life. Jane's on a mission to re-up with the Space Corp, but it's a no-go. Life's a real roller coaster, huh? They heard his story and said he couldn't go to space, basically ending his dreams. So Jane flipped the script, changed her name, and bounced to NYC to start fresh. She hustled, trying to make a living, and wound up telling juicy tales as the unwed mama. That's how Jane wraps it up. Now, here's where it gets wild. The bartender pops a question out of nowhere. Would you ice this dude if you had the chance? Jane's like, hell yeah. Bartender's all like, I can make it happen. Jane ain't trusting that. But then out of nowhere, the bartender drops her current name, which is John. John's still side-eyeing the bartender, but then the bartender plays the I work for Robertson card. That's the magic word, and John's all in. They slide down to the basement, and there's this kit that the bartender claims is a time machine. John's like, for real? Bartender nods, and they disappear. Next thing, they're in 1963, Cleveland, Ohio. John's tripping from the time jump, but the bartender hooks him up with some cash and gear for the mission. Bartender spills the beans. The dude who messed up John's life might be the fizzle bomber, and if John takes him out, the job's his. Bartender bounces, leaving John to handle business. On this rainy night, John's undercover, waiting for the dude in a sketchy hallway. He collides with a girl, looks away, and she asks if he's lost. John plays it cool, saying he's waiting for someone. 
She drops this line. Good things happen to those who wait. John finally connects the dots, realizing he's been the dude all along, and he finishes the quote. John does a double take when he spots Jane. She looks amazing. He can't help but say, wow, you're gorgeous, you know. Jane grins. Guess you just told me. Meanwhile, a snooping agent lurks nearby, but eventually splits back to his botched mission. The agent spots the fizzle bomber, who's just set a bomb. The bomber sees the agent and dodges his first shot. They exchange gunfire, but the bomber bolts. The agent follows, but ends up in a dark basement corner. He hunts for the bomber, but the bomber ambushes him. A punch knocks the agent down. Suddenly, familiar gunshots urge him up. He heads to the bomb and sees his past self when he scorched his face. He helps his suffering former self, and they share a glance before his past self time travels out. The agent grasps his failure, takes a piece of the bomb, and vanishes through time. He jumps to 64, vents his anger, preps, and logs everything. In 63, John and Jane grab coffee. Jane starts by saying, Just so you know, I'm not the friendliest gal around. John's got some serious knowledge, so he straight up spills the beans to Jane. No beating around the bush. Jane's blown away by how they both peep at folks and think they're top dogs. She hits up John, curious what makes him feel so high and mighty. John cracks a sly one, saying he's got some mind-reading mojo. Jane's all in, daring him to take a peek at her thoughts. John starts dropping truth bombs about her life, struggles, and love vibes. Jane plays it off at first, but she's slowly falling for John's game. John shows some empathy, connecting with Jane's tough journey. They keep chatting and eventually lock lips. Things switch up when the agent's in a hospital hall meeting Robertson. The agent hands over a bomb piece and Robertson clocks it as an illegal move, but he's cool with it, claiming rules sometimes hinder saving lives. The agent's got doubts about the next gig, knowing Jane's in for some serious pain. Robertson spills the beans on why the mission's a must, keeping an agent born from a time loop like John in the mix. Robertson gives the agent a pep talk, then bounces. The nurse pieces out from the ward, and the agent snags Jane's baby. He jets to his spot, preps the kid for time travel, and sets the date, September 13, 1945. He takes the baby and rolls. He switches his getup, drops the baby at the orphanage door where it all began. He wishes the kid well, rocking both John and Jane's names. He rings up the orphanage, job done. Back in Cleveland, Ohio, 1963, the agent spots John and Jane on a bench. John spots the agent, tells Jane to hang tight, and strolls over packing heat, feeling majorly played. The agent gets it, understands the pain, but still says, it had to be this way. John spills his heart, tells the agent he's head over heels for Jane, and the agent gives a nod. Then the agent breaks it down for John, who Jane used to be, who she is now, and who the agent is. John's mind clicks, he's speechless, but the agent says, it's all on track, buddy. John gazes at Jane, not ready to let go, but he knows the score. The agent takes John to HQ, promising a better life. John's wiped out from the ride, so nurses whisk him away. Outside, the agent and Robertson chat. Robertson spills the beans. John had to live a whole life to become the crime-stopping hero. The agent's still worried about the fizzle bomber, but Robertson drops a bomb. The bomber made the agency tougher. The agent's shocked, but Robertson hands over the timer and new leads. Robertson says when the agent reaches his final stop, the kit goes kaput. The agent nods, they pat each other, and it's goodbye. The agent leaves John some recorded messages, takes off. He jumps to 1975 NYC, chills out in a chair waiting for the kit to quit. Surprise, surprise, it doesn't. The agent checks Robertson's lead. He's still on the bomber's trail. Meanwhile, he hunts down a typewriter, scores one at an antique shop, and starts pounding out a novel. After finishing that book, the agent, who's been hiding in plain sight, turns out to be this dude named John. And guess what? The whole book he wrote? It's actually about his own wild life, so... John starts putting the puzzle together about this fizzle bomber thing, and man, it's not looking good. He grabs his piece and heads to the laundromat. When he kicks in the door, who does he find? An older version of himself, the fizzle bomber. John's pretty bummed about what he's become, but the bomber's like, I did what I had to do to save lives, man. John ain't having it, though. He lays into the bomber about all the innocent folks he messed up. Then he straight up tells the bomber he's never going to be like him. But the bomber drops a bombshell. It's destiny, man. If John offs him, he's next in line for the bomber gig, the bomber's last pitch. Love, of all things, but John ain't feeling the love. He shoots the bomber without blinking. It all clicks into place. This crazy loop ain't stopping. Baby, young Jane, grown-up John, the single mom, the mystery lover, and the agent. They're all one and the same, stuck in this destiny jam. Now, as the new agent John flips the script on his preordained life, old John's gearing up for his next preordained move, 
Crazy, right?